Good evening, everyone, and welcome, Peter. Peter is a videographer specializing in climate change and clean energy based in Midland, Michigan, which is, I guess, where he's coming from tonight. Peter brings a lifetime of personal experience in energy issues. For more than a decade, he's produced a monthly video series for Yale University, <laughs> excuse me, School of the Environment, and has interviewed, worked with, traveled with, and learned from hundreds of the world's leading scientists and engineers. He's created hundreds of educational videos correcting climate science misinformation. Boy, we sure need that including his independent Climate Denial Croc of the Week series and the monthly This Is Not Cool series for Yale Climate Connections, which has run since February 2012. And if you don't get it, I highly recommend you subscribe to the Yale Climate Connections. It's wonderful. As media director of the Dark Snow Project, an international crowdfunded science communications initiative, Peter has traveled many times to climate hotspots, including the Greenland ice sheet embedded with scientific teams. His videos are recognized by experts internationally and have established Peter as a frequent presenter on climate renewable energy and science communication. In 2017, the National Center for Science Education recognized Peter as a quote, friend of the planet wonderful. His programs are known for vivid multimedia and video, as well as a deep firsthand knowledge from climate front lines, including in the trenches insights on citing climate solutions in the heartland. Peter is a graduate of the University of Michigan. We're honored to have you tonight. Peter, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and see if I can get things to run here. I hope that I can stay within the boundaries of your time, but uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start with Greenland and we, there's so many places we could start and so many ways we could take this, but uh, I'm sure most of you have some idea where Greenland is. It's, uh, the world's largest island uh, as far as scale. It's uh, three times the size of Texas, very large. 98% uh, of it covered with ice. Uh, and that's uh, part of the issue that we're dealing with here is that ice is starting to melt. I went there for the first time 10 years ago with uh, the gentleman in the center there, Dr. Jason Box who I had interviewed a number of times at scientific conferences and uh, we hit it off and uh, we had uh, that first year, an amazing adventure uh, introducing me to Greenland and uh, some of what was going on there. Uh, relevant to uh, what we're gonna talk about today is just the, uh, the melt that is going on on the surface of Greenland, which I'm sure you're all aware of. I wanted to give you sort of a up close look at what that uh, looks like on the surface. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of streams like this uh, in areas that are warming uh, over broader and broader expanses of the ice sheet year by year. And this water is bringing heat deep, deep into the ice. Uh, this is a process that's been ongoing for millennia, but it's, it's going on over broader and broader expanses of the ice sheet that have never seen that kind of melt before. So uh, the, the ice is changing and it's moving and we're learning more and more about the dynamics of that uh, all the time. Uh, I have no reason really to put this here other than to just show you what kind of a deeply weird place the ice sheet is where things move in unexpected ways and it kind of uh, uh, changes your head around to spend some time there uh, as I have. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with just, uh, uh, I've been 
back now a number of times over the last decade. I'm going to go to the most recent uh, trip was in uh, July of 2022 and just talk through that because I think it gives you uh, maybe a little bit broader perspective of some of the diverse landscapes of Greenland and what we're talking about when we uh, talk about the glaciers and the ice sheets and the way they uh, uh, interact with, uh, with tundra and uh, other features of Greenland. So anyway, this is uh, taking off with uh, an Air Greenland chopper from Conger Lusawak. Uh, this is an old Strategic Air Command base, and uh, sometimes it seems to me there must be some kind of zoning uh, requirement in Greenland that every airport must be near a 500-foot granite wall, but maybe that's just because there's so many 500-foot granite walls in Greenland. Uh, this is what the coastal area looks like uh, in the summertime. There's You're uh, away from the ice sheet. We were going to look at a finger of the ice sheet, a glacier called Inguisada Cernia, uh, which is just a, uh, one or two glacial valleys up from Kangalusuak. So this would be on the western or southwestern side of Greenland. And um, to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, from the air from a drone. This is the outlet to that glacier. And I'll talk about that some more, but uh, this is a long finger coming out of the main part of the ice sheet uh, that has carved its way through these hills for many, many uh, millennia. And what you see here is the leavings uh, of glacial dust and rock as this part of the ice retreats back into the main body of the, of the ice sheet itself. And this uh, upwelling that you see down here is where a major portion of the meltwater that's coming out, out of the glacier is apparently uh, just because of the peculiar geography of this place, it's finding its way down to a very deep level and then being pressurized and then it uh, comes back up. And uh, this is what the scientists wanted to, to get at. Uh, they were looking at this meltwater uh, actually to do a measurement to see how much methane there might be uh, in these meltwaters coming off the glacier because this is an area of active research as the glacier retreats. Uh, there's a certain amount of methane that comes off and we wanna find out if that's a significant uh, source. And I would say that's fair to say that's an area of active research. Uh, I don't, it doesn't look like that's gonna be a, a game changer one way or another, but it is a data point that scientists are looking at. And I, uh, I found myself there because I, uh, uh, I called up my friend, a uh, gentleman in the red here, Merrick Stebaugh, who I had met 10 years before. And uh, I had a little bit of money in a budget and I wanted to see if he was doing any project. And he said, sure, you know, you can come along. Uh, but uh, there were some conditions on that that uh, I was not aware of. Uh, first one being that this is the view that I had from my tent. Uh, for the several days that we camped there. And uh, Marek had told me that we would we would come in on a chopper, but we'd have to walk out. Uh, what he didn't tell me is that we would be in this valley and that I would have to walk up this 1200 foot wall to get out to where we could even walk the 14 kilometers to get to our rendezvous point where we could get picked up. So I had several days to look at this and wonder if I was going to die going up this hill with a pack, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, but uh, finally that day came and at least it was beautiful. So I felt like if I was gonna die, this is probably, uh, you know, as nice a day as any to do it. Uh, but uh, 
I, I did make it slowly. Everybody else there was about 30 years younger than me. So uh, I definitely was the trailing member of the team. Uh, but I did finally make it up there. You can get a good view uh, across the main portion of the ice sheet here and kind of see how this uh, this glacier snakes down. Uh, so then it was uh, 14 kilometers to get to the road and we were being observed along the way by these guys. Uh, these are musk oxen, uh, which you may have heard of. They're, they're not really oxen. Uh, they're more like mountain goats, but they have these uh, amazing wool coats and these uh, horns that make them look somewhat prehistoric. And uh, they're curious about us. Um, they followed us uh, off in the distance kind of all along the way until uh, they finally uh, finally got tired and decided they had better things to do. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty fascinating uh, view into the wildlife that you see here that uh, subsists off of this tundra vegetation that is very thick. And uh, when you walk on it, it's first of all exhausting, but you get a, a sense of why the Arctic can uh, absorb so much carbon uh, as this kind of very dense growth springs up every summer and pulls, uh, pulls carbon in from the, uh, uh, from the atmosphere and then uh, gets gradually layered and layered and layered into uh, the tundra and eventually into permafrost. Um, so we, uh, we finally found our, found our way out. Uh, you might be able to see the road along here. That is, uh, where we were going to get picked up. It's actually, that's the longest road in Greenland. It's about 25 miles long and, uh, gave me the opportunity that day to return to a place where I had camped, uh, about seven years before. And, um, I, uh, I was able to compare this picture that I took in 2015 with the same location uh, seven years later. And you can see uh, quite a bit of change that uh, makes it clear that although this ice sheet is, is enormous, it is changing quite rapidly in human terms uh, along the boundaries. And that's, uh, that's really the... Uh, the issue that we have is an enormous amount of water, first of all, uh, is uh, potentially changing sea level. And there's uh, potential for about 22 foot of sea level rise locked up in the Greenland ice sheet. Nobody thinks that's going to melt immediately, but you can imagine even a 5 or 10% change in that mass would be pretty significant uh, as uh, Dr. Jason Box, my colleague, uh, speaks to here. So in the current climate, uh, Greenland is already beyond its threshold, uh, where it's now losing 10,000 cubic meters of ice per second. That's the average loss rate. Now, that loss rate will only continue as the climate heats up. So a uh, tremendous amount of water going out into the Atlantic, and this is like fresh water floating, uh, kind of creating a, uh, a surface layer of water that is less salty and a little bit colder than the ambient water there. And so uh, this is a, um, a graph by, NASA globe by NASA and you can see Greenland there and this is uh, showing heat anomalies or warming anomalies uh, around the planet between 2014 and 2018 and what the striking feature is that blue patch which is a cooling area and really uh, if you were to spin this globe around you'd see everything was everything on the globe is red and yellow except for that one patch Hmm. Uh, just south of Greenland, which is uh, which is kind of remarkable, and um, what it's an indicator of, and the reason that it's significant, is because this particular area is 
important for the global oceanic circulation. You may be aware that uh, the oceans have currents in them that turn all around the planet and uh, take thousands of years to cycle through. But this particular area right up south of Greenland is you might consider a critical junction uh, because it's a place where as the water is coming up, uh, the dry air off of Canada and Greenland uh, causes it to become uh, saltier, it evaporates a lot, so it becomes saltier, and then it sinks, or at least it has for many, many millennia, it sinks and then starts heading back south again. And so that's, you could think of this almost as like one of the pumping stations of this global oceanic circulation. So possibly over the last few months, you might have seen uh, news about people's concerns about the Atlantic current possibly slowing down or even shutting down uh, sometime in the not too distant future. And this is the concern that people have. They're, they're talking about this place because this warm current of water is what brings an awful lot of heat up to places like Northern Europe uh, and keeps them relatively moderate, much more moderate than they would otherwise be. But now, as we're uh, melting water off of Greenland, it's measurably slowing this down. And so it's a big concern about where we're at and what this might do uh, in the coming uh, decades or, or longer. But uh, so I took this question to uh, an acquaintance of mine that uh, I see that somebody you know, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Mann, and I made this the uh, starting point for one of my Yale uh, Climate Connections videos from a few years back. And I think it's a good explainer since this is something that's been in the news uh, recently and it it's kind of an indicator of why we're concerned about Greenland, even above and beyond uh, the sea level rise issue. There may be even, even larger implications for that mouth up there. Do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Okay. NASA came out with their annual presentation on temperature the other day. They had one animation that showed temperature warming on a spinning globe. And we saw basically the reds and yellows over the whole globe, except for that spot on the North Atlantic, that stubborn blue spot. Yeah. So update us on that. There has been a cooling in this one region uh, of the North Atlantic, south of Greenland, um, uh, over the past century that is without precedent over the past thousand years. So as the rest of the world is getting warmer, um, that region in the North Atlantic has seen some of its coldest temperatures on record in uh, recent years. And it sticks out like a sore thumb when you look at the observations, which are red and yellow everywhere, except for that blue patch in the North Atlantic. When you look at the mechanisms that could produce that sort of fingerprint, that pattern of cooling in that region um, in the face of warming everywhere else, uh, really, there's only one viable mechanism, and it's the slowdown of the so-called conveyor belt ocean circulation pattern, that global conveyor belt, that so-called um, uh, thermohaline circulation, uh, popularized, of course, in the film uh, The Day After Tomorrow. The northern hemisphere owes its temperate climate to the North Atlantic current. Heat from the sun arrives at the equator and is carried north by the ocean. But global warming is melting the polar ice caps and disrupting this flow. Eventually, it will shut down. And when that occurs, there goes our warm climate. Day After Tomorrow, the film, the premise uh, is based on science, but it was greatly overblown. And frustrated a lot of uh, climatologists. The Gulf Stream system is a very important part of the climate machinery of our planet because it transports huge amounts of heat 
and is uh, the reason why the whole region around the northern Atlantic is warmer by several degrees centigrade compared to what would be normal on that latitude. Uh, there has been a concern since the 1980s that this system might be unstable and that due to the global warming we are actually slowing down the Gulf Stream system. What if what we do now is introducing so much fresh water into the North Atlantic that the North Atlantic current would sort of stop? That would make it terribly cold in Denmark where I come from because we are, all of Northern Europe is placed at completely unreasonable latitudes. Just because of we have the North Atlantic current, we have remote heating, so to say. If that's going to be switched off, we are getting very, very cold. But still the Earth could get warmer on average. It's just a distribution problem now. In principle, there's, there's no reason why the Earth could not get warmer, but still Northern Europe and North America could get cold. Still that area is not large compared to the global area. We are 50 years to 100 years ahead of schedule with the slowdown of this ocean circulation pattern relative to what the models predict. Why might that be true? Well, one of the things that the models are also aren't capturing is the rate at which we are losing uh, ice from the ice sheets, the West Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet. Greenland melting actually can explain a, a, a significant fraction of you know, this freshening of, of the, the, the North Atlantic, just south of Greenland. If it's in Greenland, it flows into the North Atlantic. It freshens those waters, which uh, lessens the density of the waters at the surface, which inhibits the sinking motion in the subpolar North Atlantic that drives that global conveyor belt. The current depends upon a delicate balance of salt and fresh water. We all know that. Yes, but no one has taken into account how much fresh water has been dumped into the ocean because of melting polar ice. I think we've hit a critical desalinization point. The critics say there's uncertainty, and uncertainty is, is a reason we shouldn't uh, act on this problem, when in fact the uncertainty has in general broken against us. As we learn more, as we get better observations, we're seeing that things are happening sooner than we expected, faster than the models predicted, and sometimes there are unforeseen consequences. The fact that the Greenland ice sheet is losing ice through melt into the North Atlantic earlier than the models suggested it would means that you're freshening the North Atlantic earlier than the models suggested it would which means you're slowing down that ocean circulation pattern uh, earlier than the models suggested we would. And so once again, um, the more observations we get, the, the more sophisticated our models become, the more we're learning that things can happen faster and uh, with a greater magnitude than we had predicted just years ago. So, uh that is one of the issues of course we could talk for hours uh about uh some of the other uh interesting points about how ice is melting and what we're learning about it and uh the lessons about ice sheet dynamics that we had not really even imagined until about 15 20 years ago uh but importantly, uh, I always like to talk about, okay, what are we doing about this? And um, so mapping out the problem of uh, global CO2 emissions uh, have been uh, rising, as you all know, for, for some time. Uh, this is a more recent uh, map showing where emissions have gone and this is where we have to go with them which is a pretty daunting kind of a path if, you, uh, if you're a skier this would be a triple black diamond slope that we have to get down and so far all we've been working on is the bunny slope so uh we have we have uh, an incredible challenge 
that we've got to overcome here. Um, we're making some progress. Uh, the green, the solid green line uh, that you know, runs along the bottom of this graph and starts to curve up shows you that uh, uptake of uh, renewables, uh, low carbon or no carbon energy is uh, accelerating and that's good, but we've still got a long way to go. We are seeing things like uh, solar, uh, electric car sales, uh, residential heat pumps and battery storage. If you look at these curves, you can see they're all on a accelerating path, what economists call an S curve. And so they are, uh, they're moving all of them in the right direction, but it is excruciating when you recognize the scale of the problem and how fast we have to move uh, that electricity generation globally while it's rising and it's up between 15 and 20 percent uh, perhaps this year. Um, that's just not anywhere close to where we have to be. Now, um, you folks in California have been doing some good work. Uh, Mark Jacobson of Stanford tweeted this out today uh, showing that um, for seven days, for at least a few hours each day, California was producing more than 100% of its electricity demand with wind, water, or solar, uh, zero carbon energy. So they're actually exporting uh, clean energy to the rest of the country. So, uh, and and he, he notes here, it's not even spring yet. So that's, uh, uh, that bodes well. And it's an indicator and a lesson to the rest of us that uh, uh, we can move in this direction. But uh, this is kind of the nub of what I want to talk about. This is the really the focus of my work uh, for the last few years. This is Jed Walder. Uh, Jed is a multi-generational farmer in uh, sort of West Central Michigan, a place called Mont Montcalm County. Uh, Jed uh, left home at age 17 and spent 20 years in the military doing things that he, I guess, couldn't tell me about or he'd have to kill me. And then came back to, uh, to run the farm and uh, he was also a trustee on the township board there. And so when wind developers came looking to, uh, to site clean energy there, uh, he was one of the people that was kind of on the front line to decide, first of all, as a farmer, did he want to uh, have uh, wind energy on his land? The answer is yes, because he'd been to Germany and he'd seen clean energy in action there. And he thought, thinks it's the future and he wants to be part of it. Uh, but uh, there is a, uh, there is a terrific struggle going on uh, across the heartland right now. And it's because the fossil fuel industry uh, and uh, some of its, uh, some of the bad actors who are working for it have shrewdly figured out that the sleepy little township boards in counties and townships across uh, the heartland are kind of a critical choke point where if they can stir up enough opposition and disinformation about clean energy, as they have about so many other issues, uh, they can they can block projects and, and they've been doing that. And these farmers and landowners are taking the brunt of that. So I'm going to share with you some of the stories that they've been telling me over the last uh, six or seven years that I've been talking to them. There are these organizers that come in um, that are totally invested in the destruction of wind and solar and the destruction of local communities that might support it. Those people don't have good intentions and those people have a certain agenda. Those people come into these rural communities and tear them apart and leave. That's real. These um, 
either national groups or state level groups that come in and help these advocates organize and they have a template all the signs that they put up on the roadside and all the websites look the same and they're the same stock photos of a wind turbine on fire that have been used hundreds and hundreds of times over if you look at the things that are being presented on our community you'll see those same exact tactics whether it's in ohio or indiana or wherever you're talking about same exact information being shared facebook to facebook same stuff being shared at township meetings that's the scary part i honestly don't think that the neighborhood people thought this up by themselves i said right from the start that you guys are being coached a lot of the stuff that they ask you add, like where'd you hear that from or how do you know that or you know they're being coached i'd been on that palace uh, planning commission for the 20 years or whatever we had never had an issue such as this come to be and um i think they're being i don't know if coached you want to say or or influenced from a higher up entity Somebody must be encouraging them to make sure that they are, have something to say about it, trying to talk it down. And they, they have this, this set piece where they come in and they tell you, these groups that they have to overwhelm the townships with emotion and flash mobs and near riots and yelling and screaming and intimidating local elected officials, intimidating farmers, intimidating anyone who stands up for property rights and stands up for what we believe might be the future. There were people that would attend the meetings and from outside our township, other townships, but also outside the county. We did one Zoom meeting and we had phone calls from out of state and, and they, would be, they would be very negative. They would actually be very brutal at times towards me as, at the, as a supervisor. It got, it got really ugly, and, and to be honest with you, I don't think these people are capable of being that way without being prodded by somebody. But they really wanted some power, and that was coming from these bigger group of people telling them exactly what to do. And you saw the same people going to all these meetings all the time. Same people. It was predictable. They're yelling and, and saying horrible things to people and how horrible our township officials are and how could they do this to your community and you're pulling these people apart. And you try to you know, speak your own opinion and you were shut down. Once we started getting into all this, there'd be probably 40, 50 people there, uh, a lot of them from different townships, different counties. Not anybody that would be voting in our community, but they wanted to put butts in seats. And that's what the narrative was supposed to be, is all these people don't want them. We had people from Sydney Township, Winfield Township, Maple Valley. These people had got together a group, and they would go to our meeting, which was on the first Wednesday, to Sydney's meeting, to Pine Township's meeting, to Maple Valley, to Winfield, and they would make the circuit. These people, they pretty much made this their lifestyle, is, is what it come down to, just absolutely paranoid about the whole situation. Well, I mean, you got some of these people that are going to these meetings, that's all they would do. And I'm thinking gasoline's five or six dollars a gallon the past two years, and they've got money enough to travel to do these kind of things. I mean, it's... Why wouldn't they spend their money doing something better than that, you know? They would actually bring popcorn to our meetings. They were making, trying to make the whole thing look like a giant sized joke is what they were trying to do. And they did, and they did a pretty good job of it. I mean, obviously they're very organized. Obviously somebody is telling them what to do. But some of these people before all this went on were, were friends of mine. And honestly, they would have never thought of this stuff by themselves. Yeah, we had a gentleman from the Thumb area, Norm Stevenson. Um, I always dreaded seeing, when I was on Zoom, seeing Norm there because all he does is stir the pot. Uh, we had a proposal for a wind farm up in Midland County, which we have now. But I went to a meeting in one of the townships and uh, 
I know I, I'm a lifelong Midlander. I know my people pretty well. Mm -hmm. you know? and there was a room full of people. I don't know who these people and are. And you didn't know any of them. Mm -mm. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And, and they would come, they would disturb the meeting. I mean, literally, they would be pounding on the on the floor or on the cabinets that were next to them, just to make noise, you know. And um, and basically, if anyone responded, it was more that they wanted to argue with you about it and get you all riled up, so you would be mad and you would say things you shouldn't say. And a lot of times, the the pro people were farmers. And a farmer puts in 12 hours a day, what's the last thing he wants to do at night? Go to a township meeting or something. And a lot of farmers just aren't outspoken. They're quiet people, they want to mind their own business, and they don't like making wage. The other people won't come to the meetings if they think they're going to get attacked. You know, we had to be there because we're the board. But somebody that maybe has signed for a wind turbine or, or wind or solar aren't going to come because they don't want to be blasted like we were. But there's got to be something back there somewhere. When people that you knew, friends and neighbors, turn into like a cult type situation. And maybe, I, maybe I'm not going to say that I'm 100% right, but it was very, very strange. And these anti-groups are, are overwhelmingly, um, they have overwhelming numbers when they come to a little township. They've got deep pockets. I mean, they'll spend five or $10,000 on a local township election. I mean, just crazy things like that. So, yeah, that's outlining the problem. I, I want you to know just uh, kind of how serious it is uh, in terms of the, the the feeling of threat that these people are having. Did you ever feel personally threatened or? Uh... I, I did. It got, it got so bad, we had to have sheriff deputies at our meetings. When I was chairman, I'd have to have a, a deputy sheriff there most of the time to uh, keep peace. A, a guy that owns a furniture store in town we told everybody, don't shop at his place. You know, don't go to that furniture store, shop somewhere else because he signed his, he leased his land out. In fact, he even got a threat once somebody wanted to threaten to burn his building down. To the level of, of you know, people going and banging on each other's doors, you know, threatening officials. And these are farmers that have lived there all their lives. Their parents had lived there all their lives. They just got on the township board to try and do the right thing and they're being accused of every single thing in the world. One meeting, one of the gals, she'd come after me and another fellow that was on the board. I, I thought she was going to bite us, come after us like a barracuda, just on a, a just rah! Our township officials were threatened. There is still fear within our community. That mob mentality is still being used in our community to keep people suppressed so they won't question these people. Life would be a gunfight over it. These people are so crazy. So that's the situation we have. And just to give you an idea, this is a Facebook post from one of the leadership uh, of this anti-group in the Midwest. His name is Kevin Martus. Uh, he has been trained and coordinated by a uh, so-called think tank that I know very well from uh, years of watching them as in climate uh, uh, research, various kinds. Uh, and uh, he posts on his uh, Facebook page a picture of a burned out truck that was apparently burned up in a protest, similar protest in Australia against wind farms. And he says, I don't condone this at all, but I have warned state legislators that the true cost of 40, 50 or 60% wind generation must include the cost of a new capital building because folks won't take it and will resort to extreme actions. This was posted just a few weeks before uh, armed uh, gunmen entered Michigan State Capitol 
and uh, threatened uh, legislators and visitors to the Capitol uh, in something that the New York Times said was like a dry run for the January 6th insurrection. So the connections between the anti-clean energy and the election denial and the January 6th uh, crew are very, very tight, very, very strong. And just the way that this this uh, post is worded, I don't condone this at all, is almost sounds like sort of a mobster type mentality, like nice, nice capital building you got there, be a shame if something happened to it. And that that is very much how Mr. Martis operates. It's kind of a low level stochastic terrorism. Uh, and you heard the people saying people were afraid to go to meetings because they didn't want to be abused. I heard people say I uh, I had to take my son with me as a bodyguard. You know, uh, I have been in meetings myself where uh, very vocal aunties came in with sidearms strapped on their on their hip. Um, you know, so there's a huge intimidation game going. Now, we've had some wins, and I'm going to play for you here. Uh, actually, this is a world premiere. Uh, I, I put this together. Uh, it's a tale of two counties, actually. One county in southeast Michigan, Lenawee County, turned down a wind farm uh, through the same process about a dozen years ago. And the, those developers turned around and went uh, about 140 miles north to a place not far from me called Gratiot County, where they were embraced. And uh, I thought, OK, this makes a pretty good natural experiment. I mean, they turned away clean energy in one county and they embraced it in another county. Uh, let's go back after a dozen years and ask them how things are going. And uh, so that's basically the theme of this video. But as far as uh, the wind energy, we've kind of seen what's happened to that for our area. Um, when, when all the townships uh, made exclusive zoning to, I might add, a state accepted land use, which was illegal, um, the wind people uh, moved up to Gratiot County and were welcomed with open arms. In 2011, uh, we saw our initial construction of the first wind farm. It has been a great deal for the community across a number of fronts. We did view uh, very much that uh, the wind farm development was an ag preservation uh, opportunity and tool, and that's exactly what it's proven to be. In 2009, 26% of the homes in Breckenridge were empty foreclosed, for sale, not moving. Property values went completely down. Probably around 2010, 2011, uh, when we started seeing turbines. We lost the sound, Peter. Can you hear it now? No. Okay. Uh, that's strange. I can't hear it either. I'm not sure what's going on. Hang on. Can you, can you hear it? No, you can't hear it? No. Okay, that's wild. Uh, all right, I apologize for that. Uh, let me let me try one more time here. Did you get any sound at all? At the beginning of that. At the beginning, and then it stopped. Yes. 
Okay, that's all right. Let's see if uh, I'll just push it forward a little bit and see if it picks back up again. No, no sound at the moment. Still no sound. Okay, I apologize for that. Uh, I and I don't know why that is. Uh, that's never happened to me before on one of these. Um, so uh, bottom line is, uh, in this particular case, uh, the punchline is for the community that turned down uh, clean energy, uh, they're struggling. Uh, they're having to continue to raise or, or ask for millages, which taxpayers uh, can't come up with to support things like schools and roads and fire department and uh, police and sheriff uh, services. And uh, meanwhile, Gratiot is able to uh, uh, improve their schools, hire new teachers and reading specialists and school psychologists uh they can whereas uh 15 years ago they couldn't keep 24-hour coverage with sheriff patrols now they have uh three cars on 24 hours a day their their uh, fire department which used to have hand-me-down equipment that sometimes didn't start in an emergency uh is now uh fully equipped fully trained with new uh new fire trucks and new equipment um, and uh, uh, they're able to keep taxes uh, either flat or even lower them uh, in, in some cases. And we're seeing this kind of pattern in, in the several counties in Michigan that have a significant amount of wind and increasingly solar development. So it's a kind of that the story that we have seen over uh the last decade or so of people uh being uh kind of uh propagandized or disinformed into voting against their own best interest and uh, uh that's what we see in lenaway county is is people who are kind of suffering and not knowing exactly the reason why but they've turned down uh not only a great source of uh of revenue but something that would help the farmers uh there to stay in business and remain as stewards of the land uh so i'll just go through just a few of the uh the objections that we sometimes hear to uh to uh clean energy and and one of the most common ones that we hear for instance related to solar is uh, people will say, oh, what about all those solar panels? Uh, aren't they going to create a lot of waste or, or uh, is that going to be just another uh, pollution problem? Uh, this is a diagram from an article in Nature uh, Physics that came out a few months ago. And I was actually, I got a uh, email from the author, uh, Henry Hieselmeyer, uh a few months prior to this uh it turns out he's been a follower of my blog for quite a while and uh he wanted me actually to interview him uh to talk about this but um the uh the people who are strangely concerned about uh recycling now uh when they're talking about uh, uh solar modules or something like that are people who have been able to completely ignore uh, for the last hundred years, for instance, uh, toxic coal ash. And so this graph makes a comparison between the amount of, uh, uh, say, waste from solar panels, that's assuming we didn't recycle them, which actually we are, uh, and things like uh, municipal waste, which you see up in the top left there, and coal ash, uh, which is right next to it. Uh, coal ash is the second 
largest waste stream that we have in the United States behind municipal trash. And coal ash is a uniquely toxic substance that includes lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and a hundred other uh, toxic combustion products that uh, uh, are terrible for human health and that basically gets stored in uh, uh, open pits or giant mountains, 90% uh, of which that have been tested have been found to be leaking into ground or surface waters. Uh, we produce about 200 million tons of coal ash every two months uh, globally. Uh, Dr. Hizemar told me that uh, in his calculations, 200 million tons would be the amount of uh, solar panels that we might have uh, after 40 years of global use. And uh, even if we if we stipulate that they none of them were going to be recycled, uh, the volume is small enough that it would tuck very neatly into like one small corner of one large coal mine. Uh, and of course, there are thousands and thousands of coal mines all around the world. But uh, this, uh, this particular uh, talking point is something we still hear a lot of, but it, I think it's mostly because people have uh, hardly a the foggiest clue of just the sheer volume of fossil fuels that we blast and mine and, and drill out of the earth. Um, last one I'll, I'll plug in here is uh, uh, people worry about farmland uh, and as they should, because farmland is under threat primarily from things like urban sprawl. But the the actual fact of the matter, uh, which I have been talking about for a number of years, and now we have this fantastic study kind of backing it up, uh, is that uh, clean energy is a way to preserve farmland. First of all, it keeps the farmers on the land as stewards of the land. Uh, second of all, when you put, for instance, solar uh, on uh, farmland, that farmland that's been uh, subject to industrialized farming for maybe uh, decades, if not generations, is pretty depleted. But uh, standard practice nowadays is to uh, plant them with uh, native plants and pollinators. And so Argonne National Laboratory, in co collaboration with the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, followed two solar sites uh, built on uh, on farm ground uh, in southern Minnesota for five years. And what they found was that uh, because these were planted with uh, native plants and pollinators, they found after five years that insect populations were flourishing, not just insects, but uh, ground nesting birds, small mammals, uh, everything uh, in the bottom half of the bottom part of the food chain that is so much uh, under under pressure because of uh, development agricultural practices uh, rebounded strongly. Uh, they found that um, uh, an increase in native plant species uh, diversity and flower abundance. Uh, increases in the abundance and diversity of pollinators and beneficial insects. Uh, total insect abundance tripled while native bees showed a 20-fold increase in numbers, which I thought was just spectacular. And uh, they found that uh, adjacent fields were enjoying crop services like pollination from all the additional beneficial insects that were uh, uh, propagating uh, in the solar fields. And we have uh, we have some additional uh, studies that kind of back this up from uh, Yale as well, uh, looking more at the, the actual effects on soil because the, the native plants have very deep roots. They bring nutrients down into the soil. They bring water down into the aquifer. Uh, there is ongoing research about the possibility of helping some of these polluted aquifers recover 
uh, when uh, solar is placed over them and farmers can stop pounding them with pesticides for uh, long periods of time. Uh, there is actually some evidence that uh, those aquifers can start to, to purify themselves and rebound. So, so the, the, the message here, and I'm going to go, I hope, to Q&A pretty soon, but where I'm going to close this off is that we've got, we've obviously, we've got a climate crisis on our hands. We have a set of solutions uh, for which the technology is ready. And uh, we are, but we are faced with I, what I believe the most critical barrier to uh, uh, deploying those solutions is this uh, all too effective campaign that the fossil fuel industry is waging to try to stop deploying clean energy uh, across the heartland. And if we can't do it here in the United States, uh, uh we're first of all we're going to sacrifice world leadership but we will probably fail as a species uh in dealing with this problem of climate change because uh if the united states does not lead on this then uh we're in very very deep trouble and uncharted waters indeed so with that, I think I'm going to just uh, open it up to uh, q and A. I'll, I'll I'll leave you with one one last thing. Uh, I tried to uh, advise people uh, who are following these issues to pay attention to their information diet the same way that uh, we pay attention to our our food diet. Uh, try to get. Uh, some good fiber information from primary sources, NOAA, NASA, universities, scientific uh, journals. Uh, multicolors are good, so get a diversity of sources as long as they're qualified sources. Uh, local, uh, local is good. Uh, try to support your local newspapers and media and, and interact with them. Uh, read the label on any information that you're consuming, who wrote it, when. Uh, a lot of information uh, should come with expiration dates and does not. And uh, go to trusted vendors, uh, professional sources versus your cousin Fuzzy on Facebook. So uh, uh, you can additionally find me uh, at my blog, think.blog, T-H-I-N-C dot blog. Uh, I'm also, yes, still on on. Twitter or X or whatever we call it, uh, at Peter Sinclair. I'm on Facebook. And I have a two uh, I, resource sites that I hope you look into, uh, wind101.info and sun101.org. And what I'm trying to get people to do is go to those resources and share them uh, on whatever your favorite uh, social media platform is to try to push good information into the system because uh, so much good information has been crowded out by conspiracy theories and misinformation. And we need to, uh, we need to get our, the people that are on, on our side, the allies of, of life on the planet to get as much enthusiasm and energy as these paranoid conspiracy theorists have that seem to have endless energy to uh, push uh, bad faith and uh, misinformation out onto social media. So I will open things back up here and in the hope that maybe there will be some questions and, and further discussion. Well, fantastic, Peter. That was both enlightening uh maddening and encouraging all at the same time yeah right i i uh, i think janice and i will be sh uh, alternating questions and i'd just like to start with a, a a comment to add to the fossil fuel thing uh, uh comments you were making the fossil fuel industry and that is our finance industry is equally culpable the uh, four largest U.S. banks since uh, 
the Paris Accord have funded over one and a half trillion dollars of fossil fuel projects that presumably would be uh, producing for decades, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and that's unconscionable. And the insurance industry, the seven or so eight largest insurers in the world are insuring LNG exports uh, in uh, Texas and Louisiana and so forth, and, and the projects doing those things. And it's just, uh, it's absolutely maddening. So <clears throat> I would just add to the fossil fuel uh, part of the story, uh, let's uh, put our money in in green and clean banks and those that commit to not funding fossil fuel projects and also pay attention to insurance and, and, and companies and those that we choose to support and, and uh, as well as the fossil fuel companies. So just an opening comment there that, to add to what you were saying. Janice? Unmute myself. The first question that came into the chat came in a while ago, and they were asking where the film was taken, um, the farmers, the initial one that you shared, where exactly was that? Yeah, it's a place called, uh, well, uh, the, the first one was primarily a place called Montcalm County, where I have been involved uh, over some years, and uh, it was a proposal for a pretty good size wind project there. Um, and it became uh, just a hotbed. Uh, I, I was involved in a couple of projects prior to that that we successfully overcame uh, some of those uh, same kind of tactics. Uh, but Montcalm kind of <clears throat> was a very, very intense uh, hotspot, very, very conservative, very trumpy, and there were some uh, bad actors in the local area that uh, got involved and were uh, extremely uh, uh, effective in, in uh, intimidating the local boards and the local uh, officials. Uh, I will tell you the story though, uh, I was back in Montcalm County about two days ago and uh, one of our local utilities had been uh, quietly shepherding along a so solar project across two townships there. And um, one of them was called Bushnell Township. And I have been to several meetings. The first couple of meetings I went to over the last year and a half or so were held in a, like a local uh, gymnasium because they were expecting, they, they did get some fairly good crowds. And at the first one, uh, all of us who were there in support of the solar project were threatened by a, what I would call just a gang of yahoos that were they came into the meeting. They they walked out and and sort of uh, yelled at us that they would be coming for us and they'd be back. And they uh, hung out in the parking lot under the watchful eye of the local deputy for uh, an hour or so after the meeting. Uh, and they have been uh, harassing and abusing the members of the, the board, the planning commission uh, during that time. But uh, by just quietly working with the utility and uh, answering people's questions and making adjustments in the, the plan uh, for things like, uh, how big the setbacks would be, how will you control uh, uh, decommissioning? Is there you know, controls on uh, noise and things like that? Uh, they gradually either won over or outlasted uh, the opposition in the community. And so uh, I was asked to come back on, I think it was Tuesday night. And this time I actually got to go to Bushnell Township Hall because they weren't expecting a big crowd. Uh, they were expecting, they were hoping that they would have uh, quietly be able to just pass the permit. And and, and bear with me, I, this is the story is kind of important. Uh, 
I, I found the location and I actually, I drove by the township hall twice before I actually pulled in because to me, I thought it was a tool shed. I honest to God thought that their township hall was a tool shed. It's, uh, it's basically a four prefab walls on a 25 by 18 concrete slab, no running water, no bathroom. Hmm. That's how poor some of these rural townships are. And inside they, they had an odd selection of card tables and some like folding chairs that looked like they were salvaged from like a, a school from 1940s vintage. Hmm. And we sat in there I, and I watched these ordinary people, five very ordinary looking people who had shepherded this project through over the last two or three, three, three and a half years of abuse and harassment and threats. Uh, and they had come up with a, a good ordinance and a good permit and uh, good protection for everybody in the community, as well as the property owners, the farmers. And uh, when they took the vote and approved that permit five to nothing, I was in tears. And and when I left, I tried to say I wanted to say something to him, and I I guess I managed to choke out a few words, but I literally could barely speak because seeing these people that were just so unremarkable and yet absolutely heroes for what they had done for their community and for for all of us that it was just uh, an overwhelming moment for me. And uh, so we can win, you know, and, and with, you know, with any luck, maybe that's a watershed, you know, maybe that's a, uh, an indicator of what we can do, even in places like Montcalm County, 132 megawatt solar project. Uh, that's pretty decent. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep going back and uh, we were getting some support from Governor Whitmer on this long story to tell on that. But anyway, uh, yeah, Montcalm County, but there are a number of hotspots all around the state and all around the Midwest because they've been traveling to Indiana and Illinois and Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, and the, the, the template is the same everywhere you go. Wow. That story you tell is powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Indeed, indeed. Peter, I had some questions about the Greenland part of your presentation, but I don't want to take away from the energy of what we're doing, uh, what you're talking about here in, in the, the Midwest and the solar and wind efforts. Uh, is it okay to ask a few yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump, jump right in. Sure, sure. I think it all fits together. Okay, good. I do too. Uh, well, one is, I have been reading recently that there's a number of people proposing to sink a wall south of Greenland uh, into the ocean to try to block the cold water coming off of the, the melted ice to uh, reduce the risk of the current circulations shifting. Does that make any sense to you at all? No. Me either. I, 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 it just uh, sounds like fantastical imaginary, imaginary stuff. First of all, yeah, I mean, the, the ecological impact of doing a project like that would be off the chart, you know, in, in, insofar as just the unknown uh knock-on effects there would be from something like that and 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 the expense and the there's people that are, have made similar proposals for uh, protecting the antarctic ice sheet you know yeah uh but i just think it's uh it's a, it's you dreaming yeah and for protecting the u.s southern border well yeah. More, yeah. more nonsense. Or, or or protect, you know, some people say we'll just build seawalls to protect the coast, right? Yeah. Uh, 
relating yeah. to the ice in Greenland specifically, is the rate of melt increasing? And what kind of sea level rise can we expect, not just from Greenland, but from the ice on in the in the Antarctic also and, and so forth? Uh, you know, this century, what what do you think is is uh, reasonable? You know, you may not be aware, but in San Diego right now, the the trains between San Diego and Los Angeles are blocked because uh, the train runs on the in part on the ocean front and ocean see the ocean level rise has damaged some cliffs that have fallen across the tracks, et cetera. And, you know, we're just at the beginning of the sea level rise problem, uh, and we already have a multi-billion dollar problem in, in our, here in San Diego backyard. Right. Uh, the, the, I guess maybe the most important thing to understand about the sea level rise is that the estimates have kind of kept increasing over the last, especially the last, 25 years or so uh, because uh, up maybe say say 25 years ago people were still looking at the the ice sheets as basically big ice cubes you know and if you put an ice cube so so the model was like is if you put an ice cube on a table and you you measured the temperature of the air, and then you measured the temperature of the ice and then you said, okay, how long is it going to take to melt? And but but ice sheets are not big ice cubes. They are uh, hugely more complex than anybody ever suspected uh, 20 years ago. We now know that there are. You saw all that water going down into the ice, and we now know that there are. The ice sheets are full of channels and and uh, subterranean uh, aquifers and even lakes underneath the ice and and things move and they they uh, 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 they conduct heat and they they have their own dynamic uh, for instance uh, just to give an example you saw you saw the uh, outflow of that glacier like was like coming out like that well there's some some glaciers come right up next to the ocean they're you know tidewater glaciers and that same kind of phenomena can be happening where the water is going down and then it's upwelling at the base of the glacier. And so it turns the water and it brings uh, more warm water in. So as the, the uh, ice melt upstream uh, increases that churning action, increases at the face of the ice sheet. So it undermines that, undercuts that ice much faster. You know, and so that's kind of a feedback process. And there, there are uh, at least a half dozen of these feedback processes. Like uh, uh, place, any place where there's a crack in the ice, uh, where water can collect, and you certain parts of the glaciers, especially near the edges, you'll see a lot of these cracks, and they'll have water in them, and uh, that water. Uh, has kind of a, a hydrodynamic sort of pressure that it creates uh, on the ice, and it forces those cracks wider and wider and wider. So again, it's a feedback effect. So the more melt there is, the warmer it gets. The more that water gets in there, the more it forces the ice open, and the faster it moves the edge and takes more pressure off the ice. And so uh, the ice keeps coming and it keeps accelerating. So, uh, so the ice is very dynamic and it is accelerating the amount of uh, water that's coming off. And we can measure that with uh, satellites that are pretty accurate in showing us uh, how much how much weight of ice is being lost. Uh, like Dr. Box, you you heard him uh, give that number, which was fantastically large i can't even remember what it was but uh so 10 cubic i 10 cubic meters of ice, ice per second something like that yeah so so i think the the 
some of the more credible recent estimates are that the sea level rise is going to accelerate and that we could see an additional foot or more of sea level rise by 2050-ish and that it will continue to accelerate uh, after that. So it's, it's, there are, there are people that will tell you that, you know, a meter of sea level rise by end of century is, uh, is in a very likely kind of range, but the, the potential estimates go to, you know, six feet or more by the end of the century. So we could get to, uh, to, uh, you know, a place where we're getting like a, a foot of sea level rise per decade, you know, at a certain point. And there's certainly, there is evidence in history of when ice sheets have melted in the past that they can collapse fairly rapidly, uh, at least in human terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's daunting, but already, as you mentioned, you know, the, the impacts are, are enormous. And uh, in particular, because infrastructure like that is being impacted and homes uh, uh, in coastal areas uh, are being impacted, insurance companies are being uh, decimated by uh, the increasing uh, payouts that they're uh, having just in, in terms of the the normal coastal flooding, tidal flooding that takes place, but then as extreme storms come in riding on that additional sea level rise, uh, that's creating much, much greater damage than what, uh, what insurance companies have historically been able to, to account for in their, yep. in their charges. You know, just they can't keep up. Adding to that thread, I'll be back with you in a moment, Janice, but just adding to that thread, several communities in Southern California, coastal communities, have added sand to increase their beach front or are planning to do that in a variety of ways to, to the tune of multiple millions of dollars. A community in Massachusetts, this was a news item from today that relates to this a uh, community in Massachusetts uh, just paid $500,000 to add sand to its beach, and within days, it was gone. Right. I saw that. You know, yeah. it's like, I, I, somehow I, I think we're not paying att enough attention to these impacts. And, you know, it's wonderful that the folks in Michigan can some of them benefit economically, but these the and, and these stories say we need to get everybody benefiting economically and stop this nonsense. Yeah, sorry, Janice, you go. Sure, um, Ronald referred to the um, fact that California had run on a hundred percent renewable energy. And wanted and mentioned other places have done so as well. And his question was um, if there's a database of this kind of information that could be referred to in talking about successes and how renewable energy is having an impact. Well, if you follow uh, Mark Jacobson, I think it's uh, MZ Jacobson on Twitter. Uh, that would be a, a good start. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a guy named, um, uh, I want to say Mark Lewin, L-E-W-I-N, in Texas, who does a pretty good job uh, following things. Texas, Texas is a critical state, uh, just like California is, and it's uh, they're almost like... Uh, uh, bookends um, because uh, one is a very conservative, one is more progressive, but they're both uh, doing some of the most important work uh, um, in terms of deploying clean energy at scale. 
uh, with with kind of completely different uh, uh, one's very very uh, uh, top down and the other is very very market based. Thank you. Um, another question was regarding the importance of implementing renewable energy in the Midwest. Why is it particularly important there? Well, because there's uh, a lot of a lot of space. You know, that's where you have a whole lot of open land. You've got a lot of uh, flat uh, fields, and uh, and you have. Um, the challenge you have is that uh, you have to get that uh, you have to get that energy out to the markets. So, uh, in a, in states like the Dakotas or Kansas or Nebraska, uh, that's one of the big hangups is getting enough transmission to get that clean energy out of there, whether it's solar or wind. Uh, the advantage of having of siting clean energy in a place like Michigan or Illinois is that you've got uh, some big load centers right close by, and so transmission is uh, less of an issue, although it's it's an issue locally. Uh, so, you know, besides the problem of gender resistance against clean energy, you've got structural problems of uh, aging transmission lines that need to be upgraded or, or entirely new transmission built, which is uh, also just a horrible permitting problem. And you run into the same kind of uh, NIMBY pressures uh, that you do for, for everything else. Uh, there is some progress being made uh, on, on a transmission project there where they're undergrounding the line and they think they've got a technology to do it economically, and they can then go across, go through an existing railway right of way, so they don't have the same kind of permitting problem. It's not a visual problem. The only question is, uh, can they can they do it at a, at a cost that makes sense? And that project is currently underway. It's called the Sioux Line S O O. Uh, so I, I guess we'll know in a few years uh, whether they're successful or not. But that would be a huge, uh, uh, huge win if they can if they can figure that one out. There's just one more question in the chat, Joe, and this one is asking for your thoughts um, on the Doomsday Glacier, and if that will be an instantaneous catastrophic event. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you hear about the Doomsday Glacier, but they're usually talking about Thwaites Glacier or Pine Island Glacier in uh, uh, West Antarctica. And the reason they call them Doomsday Glaciers is because it's dramatic and it gets clicks, but also because uh, those glaciers are holding back uh, enormous volumes of ice. Uh, uh, that could uh, West Antarctica by itself, if those if two glaciers were to collapse in West Antarctica, that could raise sea level between five and ten feet. Uh, it's not something that would happen uh, instantaneously. I was talking to a senior Antarctic uh, specialist a few years ago, and uh, I my question was. Okay, if 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 Thwaites Glacier collapsed, would we know it? In other words, is has it already collapsed and we just don't know it yet? It's 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 moving and it's unstoppable and it's going to happen, uh, and and it just hasn't become completely evident yet, or is it something that happens gradually over time? And the answer is that, you know, a, a glacier is so large that you would have to measure something like a collapse in the course of like at, at least decades. But it is uh, accurate to say that we keep measuring faster and faster motion 
on some of these glacier fronts and in particular in the last two years the sea ice around antarctica which has been kind of stable in recent decades and the sea ice is important for a number of reasons but it protects those uh land-based ice sheets from a lot of the wave action and tidal action that would otherwise be constantly working on them but now the Ant antarctic sea ice has has radically uh, retreated uh, over the last two years. I mean, the graph is really stunning. And uh, so there's a lot of concern about, is this some, something that's just cyclical that happens to be, just happens to be coinciding with a couple of really warm years right now? Or is this uh, an indicator that the whole continent uh, or the whole area has shifted into some kind of new state and we're going to start to see something uh really dramatic happen there but uh don't you know don't imagine that uh suddenly a, a, a chunk of ice the size of florida is suddenly going to slide into the sea it's not going to happen that way it's just when we say collapse we just mean that it's no longer stable and it's starting to move and it's starting to accelerate in a way that has not in 10,000 years and uh, in a way that will have uh, uh, impacts possibly, you know, uh, within our lifetime and certainly within our children's lifetime. Thank you. Peter, I just have one more question also in a second. I see a gentleman with a hand up there. He's oh. he's had his. Oh, okay. Well, you let's, let's take yeah. that first. Go ahead. Uh, Derek, you're muted. Thank you, Peter, for bringing up Mark Jacobson. My brother's making a film on his work. It should be out by the end of this year, and we are excited about that. As you know, Mark has uh, planned the conversion of America to renewable energy with storage for everything along with 149 other countries. Um, my wife and I for seven years have been working on having America do a national World War II scale mobilization to build a renewable wind, water and solar energy system with storage for everything. Could you support such a mobilization if we could get it in the next Biden administration? Uh, right. Sounds like something I would support. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Let's do it. Oh, okay, Let's thank do. you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your for your uh, presentation today. It's been remarkable. Yeah, uh, you're, you're so welcome. I'm going to put uh, I just put Doug Lewin. It's Doug Lewin uh, on Twitter. I just put his uh, handle in the uh, chat. He's a, he's a Texas energy expert, and he has some of the same kinds of really good updates that Mark Jacob, Jacobson has for, for uh, California and the wider world, but especially uh, around Texas, and I think he's really good. Fantastic. Well, Peter, I only have one more question at the moment, but it's slightly different. Uh, let's go back to the farmers and, and getting them additional streams of income. It seems clear that uh, re regenerative agricultural techniques, things like uh, cover, cover crops and so forth, uh, sequester carbon. We have some, uh, and, and perhaps a great deal of it actually, uh, especially if it's composted first. Uh, we have some uh, associates that uh, are looking for, uh, from places like Taiwan and the Philippines that are looking for carbon offsets. Do you think that would be an, uh, a worthwhile pursuing uh, an offset project in Michigan or the places that, that, uh, that you're working that um, you know, once certified, we could, uh, you know, sell these offsets to people who want to buy them? 
Uh, so you're talking about having the having signing up farmers to engage in certain practices that would uh, sequester a measurable amount of of carbon carbon that could could then be monetized. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I, well, I mean, I'm sure you'd get a hearing for something like that. Uh, and and if if you can, these farmers are all pretty, they're pretty rational, you know, if you mm -hmm. can put something in front of them. A, a lot of them, uh, even some of the people who are really behind the uh, clean energy aren't all that convinced that climate change is, is that big of a threat. But if you can show them something that helps them far more profitably, uh, there's certainly a pretty good acceptance of things like uh, cover crops and, uh, you know, those kind of practices. Uh, it varies from farmer to farmer, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some pretty big operators out there that if you, uh, uh, if you could uh, convince them that, you've got something that's uh, feasible, uh, they, they would probably go all in. It'd be interesting if, to see if we could get American Carbon Registry and so forth to to work there and, uh, and, and, and help with this. Anyway, that's uh, a, a topic for further, further study, I think, and discussion. Uh, Marion. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for this really fantastic presentation. And I also always like to acknowledge how great our audiences are. I think you'll find we're a smarter than average bunch of people and uh, really appreciate their questions and the conversation afterwards. And we have a tradition here, Peter, at NCCA where we like to present our speakers with a special gift. And uh, Meryl is going to pull that up. And what we have done, Peter, <laughs> is we have bought a tree in your honor, which will be planted here in California in an area that's been burned out by the wildfires. Wow. So again, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. We great, greatly appreciate it and all the information you've given us. And with that, I know it's uh, pretty late your time. So we're going to say good night. And again, thank you. And thanks to our great moderators and Meryl for uh, being our technical guy and for all of you wonderful people for being here. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. very much. Bye. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. It's really great. Uh, perfect. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much.